Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for your patience as we get this third session of the Law Council of Australia's series on artificial intelligence underway. We've had a fantastic turnout and a lot of um, a lot of interest and a lot of really great responses to the series that we've had so far. And today promises to be another fantastic um, seminar as we look into the issues around um, IP. For some housekeeping matters, uh, I will hand over to Angus Lang, who's the chair of the Intellectual Property, Com Property Committee shortly. Uh, I am the chair of the Digital Commerce Committee. Um, I'm also the regional head of Emerging Tech at Herbert Smith Freehills. For the purposes of this seminar today, we would ask if you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A function. The chat won't be activated for this, but the question and answer facility will be. And to the extent that we can set some time aside at the end, we'll do our absolute best to answer those questions. And we also really appreciate you putting the questions in because it helps us understand what are the key issues uh, that, that might be sort of a topic for future sessions. So again, thank you so much for joining us. The recordings will be made available if you have fellow committee members who weren't able to attend in person. Please do share those recordings um, afterwards. But otherwise, I welcome Angus uh, to chair this session. Thanks very much. Susanna, and today we're very privileged to have Associate Professor Alexandra George and Dr. Mark Summerfield to address us. Uh, Dr. Alexandra George is, as, as we know, an Associate Professor at uh, UNSW, uh, having taught at universities across uh, Europe and Asia as well, uh, and her research interests in, in particular have a focus on artificial intelligence uh, and its in intersection with intellectual property law, which as a matter of practice have included contributing to WIPO's consideration of those issues. And Alexandra is, is very well placed, has spoken on a number of, in a number of forums that many of you may have seen already um, on the topic and is very well placed to discuss what the key issues are in terms of potential law reform uh, in the field and what the options might be um, in that uh, regard. Dr. Mark Summerfield is a trans-Tasman patent attorney, many, familiar to many uh, of us as well. Um, he has particular experience uh, and knowledge of um, the comparative case law. So, so Mark is just fantastic in, in, in tracking what the latest case law developments are across the major jurisdictions, yeah, US, Europe in, in particular, as well as having um, a technical and practical understanding of this, this subject matter. Um, he is currently doing a, a PhD in, in that, that field, um, which focuses, as I understand it, in particular, uh, Mark, on the use of AI to draft patent claims. Uh, Mark's going to kick off, um, and so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Mark, to commence the session. Thank you, Angus. Um, just share my screen here. Hey, is that, can we see that? Yes, we can see that. Okay, good. Right, everything's working. Great. Okay, well, um, the, the plan for today uh, in general is that I'm going to talk about uh, where we're at right now, uh, and Alexandra is going to talk about where we might go and where the opportunities for, for law reform might be. So that's that's how we've divided the work between us. Um, got quite a bit of material here, so with no further ado, I'm going to get going. Okay, so this is the outline for, for my part of the uh, proceedings today. Um, you're going to get another, if you've been to the two previous uh, talks, you've each each of those gave some sort of primer on how generative AI works for the benefit of those who weren't there, um, and perhaps for the benefit of those who were and could use a different perspective, a, a, another way of looking at it. Um, I'm going to be uh, briefly going over uh, some aspects of, of how generative AI works, in particular to understand what sort of inputs it actually uses, uh, what sort of outputs it generates, and therefore where the um, IP issues can, can arise in, in that whole process. Um, so we'll start with this brief primer. So this is a diagram from the original paper on the transformer model architecture, which underpins a lot of these large language models, um, including GPT-3 and GPT-4. Um, and I'm only really showing this for completeness and to give you the impression that my um, simplified version of this, which I'm going to show in the next slide, um, does in fact match up with the, with, with the full um, technical description of the model. So we've simplified it down here to just the main uh, building blocks of it. And I'm just going to briefly explain with the assistance of, of this um, slide how these language models actually go about generating output. 
So what happens is when you give it a prompt, if you go to ChatGPT or, or one of the other models you can access and you give it a prompt, uh, that gets fed into the model. The first thing that happens is that those words get converted into lists of numbers. So computers aren't very good with words. A word doesn't really mean anything to a computer. Numbers mean something to computers. And so there's a translation of each word, or in fact, each token, which might be somewhat less than a word, um, into a numerical representation. And those numerical representations at this point are just a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with the word. So each word is given its own numerical representation independently, or largely independently of the other words. Those are then fed into these complex system of, of encoders that do a whole lot of stuff. And if you've been at the previous uh, two talks in this series, um, you'd have heard about the attention mechanism. And one of the things it's doing is it's picking out which words relate to which other words so that in processing the data, it, the, the model can decide where to direct its attention when, when doing the processing. So now we have a list um, of sets of numbers representing that input, but now these aren't independent of each other. Now they all encode various relationships between the, the words in the sentence as well. That's then all uh, accumulated together to form a, a fairly large um, array of, of these numbers that are in some way representative of the input. So what's happened on the, on the left-hand side is that that input sentence has been encoded and this encoded representation, this very, very large array of numbers, um, is in effect a, a kind of memory of, of that input that's been put in, and it remains throughout the process of generating the output text. So it conditions effectively what happens on, on the other side of the model. Now, the first thing that then happens is that this, this output side of the model starts to generate words, and it generates one at a time. Okay, so just based on what it was given coming in from the uh, from the encoder side, it generates the first word. That word then gets fed back in. Okay, it gets encoded, it goes through this whole process, conditioned on that um, encoded version of the input prompt, a second word is generated. Then the two words that have been generated so far are fed back in again to generate the next word in the sequence. So this process continues. So it generates one word at a time, and in order to do it, the input, the output that it's producing needs to be fed back in as the input so that it has the context from the prompt that the user gave it, um, plus the words it's previously generated. And from that, it generates sequentially uh, the, the text that, that it thinks is the best response to, to that input that it was given. And the model itself decides when to end. It produces a special token that identifies the, the end of its response. So one thing to understand about this is that generative AI, which is what this is, is not the same thing as artificial general intelligence, despite the fact they have very similar acronyms. Um, this doesn't learn anything in the process of interacting with the user. So it has a memory of the input. And in fact, in the case of the, the, the chat interface, it um, underneath the hood, it's feeding back in the history of your chat with it as well, so that it has, has that larger context of what it's saying. But the model itself isn't being updated by this process. Once you stop giving it inputs, go away, um, it, it retains nothing of, of the interaction that it's had with you. Okay, the model is trained once and is then fixed. Okay, the training process, um, in cases like this, involves providing having a data set which has uh, some known inputs and known expected outputs. And so if you feed some input in and you know what you want the output to be, then you can measure somehow the dis difference between what the model is actually producing and what you want it to produce. You measure that, you feed that information back into the model, you update all of the parameters that are inside the model, the numbers that, that determine how it operates and, and try to move it closer to the desired output response. So we talk about, in cases like this, supervised learning. And often in older types of systems, um, more traditional AI systems, the, the known output is something that's been labeled by humans. Um, and you heard about this if you were at last week's uh, session. 
in the case of these large language models, it is a supervised learning process, but it's sort of self-supervised, it's sometimes called, in that what's done to train it is that some text is taken from the training set. And what you want it to do is to produce the desired matching sequence of words that continues that text. So in this case, we want the model to learn that the quick brown fox jumps should be followed by over the lazy dog. Initially, it's completely untrained. All of its parameters are just randomly initialized um, and, and it's going to miss the target badly. So it might produce complete nonsense initially, just random words. But over time, as you train it, it will get better at understanding the structure of language. So it will start to produce things that are grammatically correct, even though the meaning isn't what you want yet. And it'll gradually converge, hopefully, towards producing the, uh, the desired output. Okay, if you want more information about how this training process works uh, and, uh, and, and how these models work to some degree as well, um, there's a really good uh, description in you know, completely non-technical terms in this New Yorker article. I'll just leave this a second if you want to um, snap a shot of the screen or just write down those, those short URLs that I've put there. If you want to find these articles by uh, Cal Newport, who's a, a computer scientist um, professor in the US, uh, those, those are really excellent sources of uh, a, you know, a, a, an explanation of how this works um, in, in largely non-technical terms. If we look at, say, GPT-3, uh, because we don't know as much about GPT-4, except that it's much bigger, um, GPT-3 had 175 billion trainable parameters. Um, it was trained on uh, a training data set that included uh, content from the web, books, Wikipedia, that is a total of 45 terabytes in size. In order to train it, um, it took a huge amount of compute power, um, 14 days of, of computation using uh, 10,000 of these little devices here. Um, that's obsolete technology now. If you want to buy those now, they'll cost you about $5,000 used and refurbished uh, was, was the best I could find. Um, the latest uh, GPUs that are used for, for training these days um, cost about twenty to $30,000. Um, but they are much larger and more powerful, and therefore um, they're able to uh, do more. They use less power. You don't need as many of them. So, um, you know, we're going in the right direction. If you didn't want to just try buying and building your own system, you could rent um, facilities in the cloud, and it would cost you probably somewhere between five and 12 million US dollars to do the training of GPT-3. Um, but huge energy consumption. And as I said, as, as the hardware gets uh, more sophisticated, um, the, the cost uh, per unit of compute is, is coming down and the, and the energy consumption per unit of compute is coming down. Um, but even so, uh, these, these, these are huge numbers. Uh, and you can see why, you know, they get trained once and then they're available in the cloud for, for other people to use. Okay, so we know optimizing models with hundreds of billions of parameters um, requires massive quantities of training data, terabytes of training data. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from us. If you have a presence on the internet, if you've ever provided any content in any form, uh, then there's a very good chance that your content has been used in the training of these models. And that, of course, is where many of the IP issues around these models, at least the, the ones that are emerging as, as issues early on, uh, come into play. Okay, so let's just have a look at the relationship between IP rights and the, the inputs to AI, and in particular, um, the use of, of copyright works to train AI and what effect that's having. Okay, one of the, the first, um, Example I'm going to talk about is uh, based on taking code written by programmers, mostly um, participants in open source projects, uh, from a system called GitHub. Now, I asked Bing Chat, which has uh, GPT-4 underlying it, um, to explain GitHub, GitHub to a non-programmer without using any jargon, and, and this is what it produced. Uh, I won't read it out. You can read it for yourselves. Uh, but basically, it's, it's a way for programmers to cooperate with one another. Um, and it's a place where programmers can keep uh, code that they can make public 
if, if they wish, most do, um, who use GitHub. Um, and it's, you know, so it's a collaborative platform and it's a publishing platform um, in, in that sense. And there's been a class action uh, that's been launched um, in the Northern District of California in which programmers uh, are pitting themselves against GitHub, Microsoft and OpenAI because uh, Microsoft has developed an add-in to the GitHub interface called Copilot, which is a coding assistant. It writes bits of code for programmers. Microsoft owns GitHub and OpenAI developed the AI language models, basically GPT again, that are used to implement Copilot. The programmers are alleging that um, these companies violated their open source licenses by using their code to train Copilot. Um, because these models sometimes reproduce segments from their input training data in generating their output, they're claiming that Copilot reproduces licensed code without credit or complying with the open source license terms. Um, it accuses the companies of, of misappropriating the value of the open source code and harming the community. Um, and of course, they're seeking damages, injunctive relief, and a declaration that Copilot infringes their copyrights. Um, the defense, the key to this, um, the, the, the companies are asking the, the court to dismiss the lawsuit, which it probably won't. Um, the, the key defense here is that Copilot makes fair use of the code. So, so a big issue in these cases in the US is going to be whether the, um, the, the flexible uh, fair use provisions of the copyright law there apply. Whether it is in fact a fair use of copyright material to use it to train AI models. The second example um, is, uh, I guess in, in some ways more serious, getting images um, is a, a very, very well known um, and reasonably large and, and powerful company that provides stock images. Um, it owns the rights to more than 12 million images. Stability AI is the creator of Stable Diffusion, which is a generative AI that's trained to generate images from text inputs. Um, if you think back to, to the, the model I showed of the, of the text uh, generative AI, a, a, an image generative AI basically uses almost exactly the same left-hand side to generate that representation of the text, but then the right-hand side um, is designed and trained to generate images according to the description that has been um, captured, encoded um, in, in, that, uh, in that encoded um, representation of, of the input description. Now, Getty claims that Stability AI copied millions of its images without license and used them to train stable diffusion. Um, it's also saying that uh, Stability AI infringes its trademarks. And if you look at this example from the complaint that's been filed um, in, in the court in this case, uh, you can see uh, why they would say that. Uh, this is an example of an actual image from the Getty Images Library um, and something that they've managed to get uh, Stable Diffusion to generate. And you can see that not only, aside from some very strange things that are going on in that right-hand image, um, you, you can see that not only is it, is it clearly uh, quite closely following that particular image in this case, but it's also um, generated a uh, distorted version of the, of the Getty Images watermark. So there's pretty strong evidence there that, uh, that, that in fact it was trained on, on Getty Images data. Um, and that action has been filed in Delaware in the US, but there's also been a notice of action filed in the UK. So if both of those cases proceed, it'll be quite interesting to see how the outcomes uh, may differ or be similar, uh, depending on how things go in those two different jurisdictions. Uh, the third example is, um, again, this is the same uh, legal firm supporting this as the, the programmer's case. This is, again, another class action, and this time it's artists uh, against Stability AI, Midjourney, and DeviantArt. So Midjourney and DeviantArt are other providers of um, generative image AI models. So the allegation here is that all of these companies have violated the rights of millions of artists by using all the images off the internet to, to train the AI art tools without their consent, um, that they benefit commercially and profit richly from the use of those images in operating um, paid interfaces to their uh, products. Um, and that some of these works are actually being sold on the internet um, and therefore siphoning commissions from, from artists themselves. Um, 
the lawyer behind this and the, the programmer's case um, has said that you know their firm has heard from people all over the world who are concerned about this. Um, Stability AI for their part says that anyone that believes this isn't fair use doesn't understand the technology and doesn't understand the law. So um, they're going to, it would seem, um, fairly aggressively defend this action. There are people who are doing it differently though. Um, I asked Bing Chat again um, what the relationship is between OpenAI and Shutterstock. Um, I knew what the relationship it was between OpenAI and Shutterstock, but I thought it would save me the trouble of actually writing it up if I got um, if I got a, an AI tool to do it for me, uh, which it did. So here's, here's the output it generated. And you can see here that OpenAI and its DALI2 image generative model have avoided these kinds of problems because they actually did license images from, from the stock image library of Shutterstock. Um, and Shutterstock is, in fact, uh, passing on some of some of the proceeds to the artists whose work has been used in in the training of Gali too. So there is in fact um, you know, already examples of companies that are attempting to to recognise and, and compensate um, artists creators for for their contributions. Okay, so. That's what I wanted to cover in relation to issues around the inputs, particularly training inputs to AI. Um, and there's just a couple of further examples I want to go through in relation to some of the IP rights associated with the outputs from AI. This is uh, an image taken from a recent US copyright registration application. Um, and this is taken from the decision on that registration application. Uh, the Zaria of the Dawn is a graphic novel. Uh, and it's interesting in that all of the actual graphic components of the work have been generated using AI, using mid-journey. So it's clear in the US, um, well-established law as I understand it, that AI-generated works are, are not protectable under copyright laws. There must be a human author. Uh, but this, of course, is not a case where there is no human author. This is a case where the work is a mix of human input and AI-generated output, along with human content, human-generated content as well, all of the, all of the text. So, as I said, Zaria of the Dawn was created using Midjourney to produce images from text prompts. The um, author, Chris Castanova, wrote the text and the Midjourney prompts and arranged the images onto the pages of, of the graphic novel. They didn't disclose that the images were created by an AI model when applying to register the copyright in the work. So, copyright was registered, but then the Copyright Office learnt about the fact that the images were AI generated through Keshinova's own social media posts. And it then went and issued a notice proposing that it would cancel the registration um, unless additional information was provided. So the artist argued that they authored every aspect of the work, that as with many other uh, you know, digital tools, um, computer based tools, Midjourney was just another assistive tool that artists can use to help them um, bring their uh, vision to reality. The Copyright Office rejected that um, argument. So the Copyright Office's position is that the images themselves were not original works of authorship. There was no human author, so they could not be protected by copyright. They concluded also that Castanova was not the mastermind behind the images. They distinguished it from um, other tools that artists might use in that the output from an AI generative model like Midjourney can't be predicted in the same way that the output from a, a tool that's driven more directly by an artist can be predicted. So they said that made it different and really that the, there isn't enough authorial input um, into the finished artworks that are generated by the model. So the work actually remains registered, but the registration has been reissued and 
the, the, the compromise that the Copyright Office has reached here is that the text of the work and the arrangement of images with text are the work of Castanova, um, but that the images themselves are not. So it's kind of a partially protected work in, in that sense now. Okay, and now the um, final uh, example I want to give of, of where we're at is the now relatively infamous case of Davis, the artificial inventor. Uh, Stephen Thaler, who's a, a US-based um, programmer, software developer, who's built this AI machine that he calls Davis, has filed patent applications um, in a large number of countries around the world. And, and this map, for which I have to thank the European Patent Office, um, shows all of the places where patent applications have been filed um, and the status of those. The New Zealand status is slightly out of date because the High Court in New Zealand has issued a decision there within the last month, um, and that should now be a darker color of red. Uh, but other than that, um, this, this shows the status. In South Africa, uh, the applications naming Davis as the sole inventor has in fact been granted because South Africa has a, 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 a simple registration system. They don't conduct substantive examination of patent applications. Uh, the, the Davis patent applications were filed in South Africa through the Patent Corporation Treaty System. Um, the inventor was already named on the international application forms um, and that just passed through in South Africa without anybody having any ability to examine that or to raise any objection to it. So um, the fact that it's granted in South Africa doesn't tell us that it's legitimate or that it's valid. It would need to be challenged in court to, to find that out. Everywhere else where there have been decisions by the courts so far, um, those decisions have, have gone against um, Thaler and Davis. And thus far, every country uh, that's looked at it has come to the conclusion that uh, an inventor needs to be a human being and that a, an AI machine cannot be a, an inventor. Specifically in Australia, we were the one country in the world where, albeit briefly, um, the courts did consider that an inventor need not be a human being. Um, at first instance, uh, the court found that inventor, the word in the Patents Act, is merely an agent now, um, and an agent can be a person or thing that invents uh, and doesn't have to be a human, and that it was possible for the applicant, in this case Dr Thaler, to obtain title to the inventure as owner of the AI machine, um, effectively by first possession of its output. But on appeal to the full court, um, the, the court determined that only a natural person can be an inventor for the purposes of the Patent Act and regulations, um, that the patent monopoly, the reward for disclosing the invention is, is linked to the inventor um, and the invention is the subject of, is, is the product of human in ingenuity. Um, and so an AI system can't be an inventor under Australian law. Uh, and the court said, look, you know, if this is to change, then it's a matter for the legislature, not a matter for the courts. Uh, Thaler applied for special leave to appeal to the High Court, um, but that was refused. Uh, and the court, with the court saying it wasn't the appropriate vehicle to consider the questions of principle. If you read the, the transcript um, of the special leave application hearing, um, one of the things that seems to come across from, from the judges uh, in that instance was that they were very concerned about the fact that the court was being asked to accept at face value that an AI was an inventor and that there was no opportunity for the court to interrogate the facts around that to determine whether perhaps there may also or instead have been a human inventor that could be identified. Um, and I think the court's concern is that uh, inventorship under Australian law um, is, is ultimately a question of law, not simply a question of facts. There are, of course, underlying facts about what happened, um, but the determination of whether or not someone is entitled to be named as an inventor um, is, is ultimately a question of law for the court to determine. And the court wasn't really being given the opportunity to, to do that in this case because of the way the test case had been set up. So that's where we stand there, um, and that's where I finish my part of today's proceedings. Uh, and so um, I'd like to hand over to Alexandra to, uh, to, to continue the story. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Mark, Mark, Mark.
Uh, we seem to have a slight echo. All right. Okay, well, thank you. That was a fantastic, um, a fantastic run through of everything, and it's hard to follow such an excellent presentation. Um, what I'm going to do is try to pick up from where Mark has left off and transition into looking at the future and where we might be going with all these um, different directions that are raised by the artificial intelligence um, overlap with intellectual property. So I thought that I would start off with a, um, a little bit of a recap, but not exactly the same as what Mark covered, although there'll be some, um, you'll, you'll recognize some of the cases being mentioned again. Um, and so we'll start with where are we now? Where are we going and how do we get there? But instead of taking the sort of black letter approach and looking at uh, the content of the cases and the, um, uh, the, the law as it stands, I'm going to be looking more at where we should be heading in the future or where we could be heading in the future because there are very many options and um, and obviously I can't uh, deal with all of them in this short presentation but I'm just going to try to condense some of the ideas um, without being too academic and um, hopefully with having a little bit of fun along the way. Um, after where are we going, how do we get there and that's probably the big um, difficult part of this conversation. And um, and so I have some suggestions about the process and methodology that we could um, that we could use as we embark on this interesting journey. So where are we now? Well, Mark has just been talking about uh, Dr. Taylor and his Darbus cases. And um, there have been quite a few people who jest and a Many commentators have been skeptical about whether this mission of Dr. Taylor, as it's described in this article, is unnecessary or whether it's useful. Um, certainly a lot of energy has gone into running these test cases around the world, and it has put the issue of AI creativity right in the spotlight, just as generative AI programs such as ChatGPT are entering the public consciousness. So um, it's, it's all very timely. Um, so this article, as you can see, uh, makes a lot of fun of it. I think, while it's an amusing thing to read, um, I wouldn't be so hasty to dismiss Dr. Taylor's mission because running these test cases really is bringing to the fore a lot of the issues, well, a lot of the preliminary issues that we'll be dealing with, but it's also prompting discussion of many of the other issues that the courts haven't come anywhere near looking at yet, such as um, what would happen with Inventive Step if an AI system were to end up um, being recognized as the inventor um, for a patent purpose. So how far have we come along this path towards understanding the IP issues? Um, not very far at all. We're, we're really right at the beginning. So Mark has given you a wonderful summary of the cases that are going on around the world. So the Artists Against Ability AI and Midjourney and DeviantArt and the programmers and um, Microsoft and OpenAI and so on. Um, the two issues that have really been discussed so far in these groups of cases, uh, and there are a couple of others around the world that I mentioned, are the identification of the creator. So can an AI system be an inventor? Can it be, uh, for patent purposes, can it be an author for copyright pur purposes? And also this question of um, use of copyright protected material and the degree to which um, material that's owned under copyright law by somebody can be fed in to educate or, in, or train these systems. And, um, and how it can be used later on. But these are only two of very many relevant issues. And they've only been partially explored, even despite all these many cases that are going on around the world. So I will just focus on the issue of the identif identification of the creator as an example of this, because you've already heard about it um, from Mark. So I don't need to repeat the details too much. So um, to the extent that it has been looked at, 
as Mark told you, there are no patents for AI-generated inventions in the places where it has gone all the way through the legal system, like Australia and the US. Um, really the only place in the world that it is uh, possibly something that would stand up is South Africa, but even there, um, if it was uh, challenged, um, it's quite possible that it, it wouldn't. Um, so these um, cases are, are running in so many jurisdictions, 18 different jurisdictions. Um, some of them are still going on. Some of, the, some of them have been rejected and, and have finished um, finding their way through the legal systems of, of their jurisdictions. Others are still at the stage of judicial review or being looked at by patent officers. So there's a way to go. And it might be that other jurisdictions came out with different outcomes, but so far, the um, uh, apart from the uh, outlier initial trial judge in Australia, um, so far it's been rather consistent in the way the courts have been fighting. Um, when it comes to um, the idea of having human and AI as co-inventors, that's um, largely untested, but there is some German authority that suggests that it might be possible. Um, after the German, German Federal Patent Court ruled that AI-generated inventions are patentable, um, uh, sorry, uh, but you need to have a, a natural person as the inventor, um, the, there was this procedural problem about how you would achieve that. And so um, it opened the door to um, possibly having co-inventors because if you, it said, if you state that the AM, AI machine was involved in the invention, then that could be enough um, to, to um, meet the requirements of naming your inventor in a case where you had AI systems involved. So um, with these cases, um, you come back to the, the skepticism about whether, you know, how useful they are when they're looking at such a narrow issue and, and it is traditionally a fairly procedural issue. Um, it's, it's quite interesting in the um, UK Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Burst said that if only Dr. Taylor was not such an obsessive and instead of calling Darbus the inventor he named himself, then none of these problems would arise. Well, yes, but, um, and there are probably organizations that have taken exactly that approach of path of least resistance and um, a way of dealing with legal uncertainty by trying to fly under the radar. But of course, misidentifying your inventor could provide grounds to challenge the validity of the patents. So it's not necessarily um, a great way to, to go. So it suggests that we really do need um, better answers. So. Um, that, that's just you know one little example of issues that still remain very um, up in the air because we've ended up with courts saying, well, no, we're not recognizing AI generated um, inventions. Um, um, so when you um, sorry, I've gone the wrong way there. when when you come to copyright, so that, those were the patent cases and you've already seen um, the cash Novus, cases slide and, and Dr. Taylor's slide there. Um, these are just two of the cases that have run around the world, but they're the ones that are attracting a lot of attention because they're before the, well, they've been before the US Copyright Office um, and they're giving us some guidance as to what's happening there. Um, if you look at the way in which these issues might be treated in other jurisdictions, you get a very disparate range of approaches. So in the UK, Hong Kong, India, Northern Ireland, and New Zealand, for example, um, you could have copyright in computer generated works. And so that could take it in a different direction. In India and Canada, um, there have been copyright registrations for a painting, <coughs> excuse me, called Surast, which um, um, the applications, because it was there were registration jurisdictions, um, stated was co-authored by Ankit Sani and Raghav Artificial Intelligence Painting App. Now it's interesting that Sani is an intellectual property lawyer and um, he's indicated that the Indian Copyright Office did reject another application that claimed that Raghav, the AI system, was the sole author. So there's a bit of a pattern emerging here. Um, in China in late 
2019, a Shenzhen court um, had a look at literary copyright and litigation that involved infringement of a financial report that um, humans had authored, and they said they did so with the assistance of an AI system. And um, the chief, uh, a senior judge of that court explained the outcome um, in a commentary saying that um, because of um, uh, because the AI merely assisted human intellectual activity, it wasn't um, created autonomously by the AI, there was the possibility of having copyrights. So there is a pattern emerging here, but um, there's certainly a lot of uncertainty and the lack of clarity obviously has um, uh, consequences for people who are trying to run their businesses and decide um, you know, what, where they should invest and whether they will end up owning copyright or be able to register a patent. And so that leads us to some of these big picture issues about where we are going with all of this. So the summary is that we could just maintain the status quo. That seems to be the approach that's been taken um, in the UK, for example, I'll come back to that in a little while, um, saying no IP for AI generated inventions. And in some jurisdictions where you require a human author, probably no copyright, um, unless you have that creative spark um, that is generated by the human rather than being something produced by the AI system. Um, query how creative it is if it's being produced by the AI system because of the technology and the way it works, as Mark admirably explained. Um, another option is to evolve intellectual property. And so traditionally, intellectual property laws do evolve. They've evolved over centuries. Think back to the Statute of Anne and the Venetian Patent Act and the Statute of Monopolies, and you're going back hundreds and hundreds of years, and you've had gradual evolution to keep up with new technologies. The difference here is that it's the method of creation rather than the thing that is created that the IP is being challenged by. And so that does set it in a slightly different category to what we've seen before. So it's quite possible that we could evolve AI, uh, sorry, evolve IP and um, and incorporate AI generated creations into IP law if we wanted to. Um, that's certainly an option that's there. And it would probably be the more minimal, um, involves the, the least amount of disruption. Or we could take a revolutionary approach, which is less common in intellectual property, and if, develop a whole new sui generis AI IP doctrine. And um, it's worth thinking about. I don't have a fixed view about which is the best approach, but I can certainly see some advantages in adopting a new approach that is um, designed specifically to deal with the circumstances that we're being challenged by at present. So if we um, do decide that we're going to either um, well, if, we, if we're going to do something active to develop the law, as opposed to just sitting there and letting it evolve as cases come before the courts, then we come back to the sorts of things that you probably thought about when you turned up for your first class of your survey course on intellectual property at uni. Um, and so well, what are we actually trying to achieve with intellectual property? And what would be the point of protecting AI generated creations? And so if we think about these issues, um, obviously there's a huge amount of jurisprudence here, um, in philosophy, I won't go into it all, but the moral rights, natural rights idea of acknowledging the creator, giving them credit and giving them control over what they've created. Um, the idea of someone having a natural property right in their ideas and then by extension having the right to the exploitation of what they've created through those ideas, take something from the state of nature, mix it with your ideas and come up with something new and you get the benefit. Um, that's a very common theme running through intellectual property laws. It can apply in the context of, of artificial intelligence 
creations. Um, the question is, is the creator that we're rewarding the person who's um, instructing the AI system how to create, or is it the AI system itself? Um, at present, the technology isn't there um, for the AI to create completely autonomously, although some like Dr. Taylor would suggest it is. Um, and um, the, the general um, view from techie types who I've spoken to and worked with seems to be that we're not there yet, but we could get there in the future. Um, some would say that's a reason to just sit and wait, but others would say it gives us a window to get things right before we get there and uh, are faced with even more conundrums. The fairness idea, the need to reward someone for their efforts and their investment of time and money and energy and resources into creating. Um, and that's another very good reason for having intellectual property laws. Um, and obviously the economic incentive to invent, incentive to invest. Um, this incentive theory is very dominant throughout justifications for intellectual property. And, um, and, and again, it applies in the context of artificial intelligence. Um, my view, having looked at this in a bit of detail, is that really the, these justifications apply quite similarly in this AI environment to the way they do in general intellectual property environments, um, because it's not the AI system that is being incentivized, um, rewarded, and given moral rights. It is the human beings who are the um, brains behind the instructions to the AI systems, the creation of the AI systems, and um, the investment in those systems. So when you apply that to the ideas that we saw earlier, for example, um, the ones arising out of the Darbus cases and some of the copyright cases, how could we, um, how could we look at the law? How could we amend the law to, um, to deal with this? Well, you could just say, well, we're not going to have a human, uh, a, an AI generated um, invention that we'll, we'll recognize. We need a human creator. Or you could just say, well, we'll get rid of the need for an inventor altogether, a creator altogether. Or you could say, well, we'll have patents, but we need to have um, the human creative spark as well as the AI inventor or some alternative approach. And if we're going in that direction, um, there's a myriad of, of options. Um, in asking where we're going, we should ask what we're wanting to achieve. And um, so here are just some ideas. This is a very, very brief summary of um, big ideas about the, the reasons we have intellectual property. What would the negative consequences of not protecting the outputs of AI generative um, systems be? Um, and um, I, uh, I drew these up and I thought, oh, I might just have, um, have a look and see what ChatGPT says, see, see what it thinks its, its, reason, its problems would be if it, it didn't get its outputs protected. So it was quite interesting. I put in a couple of different um, queries asking pretty much the same thing and got exactly the same list mm -hmm. of um, negative consequences. Uh, thrown out at me each time and likewise um, when I asked it about the positive consequences same thing and um, so that's this is interesting from a copyright perspective because um, if you put in uh, if you independently create your your original work normally um, it's not copied then you could expect to have copyright all other things being equal. Um, it raises interesting questions where you have a system like this that is being fed instructions and then producing very similar outputs. Um, obviously, it's the sort of thing in a university that we're very interested in because if we set an essay topic for a student or for a class and uh, multiple students start producing extremely similarly um, written and structured essays. Um, there are questions about 
how original that is and whether or not it might constitute plagiarism. Um, and obviously those are issues that are uh, things we're having to think about from the copyright perspective as well. So to wrap up this little bit, um, really we need to go back to the drawing board and ask these big questions about what are the pros and cons of protecting AI generated works? Um, what do we want to achieve? We need to take on all the lessons, take on board all the lessons that we've got from generations, centuries of existing intellectual property laws, look at their benefits, their disadvantages, and then apply those lessons in the context of AI. And I would suggest that it might be useful to think outside the boxes as well, or on this slide, the circles is there, um, of the traditional categories of intellectual property, because it's not necessary really that we stick to those categories they've grown up in through history for various reasons they they work in, in a very established way um, we're very used to dealing with them but with an AI system perhaps we're dealing with something that could be better um, addressed by taking lessons from say copyright and patent law rather than trying to um, fit uh, the, the new technology into um, an older legal framework. And so to, to wind down, where do, well, when we've decided where we're going, how do we get there? And so there are a whole lot of ideas that I am just going to finish off with. And, and obviously this could have been several talks in itself, this section, but I just wanted to run through very quickly the life cycle of intellectual property to point out that we need to consider what will be protected, how it will be protected, when we would consider the things that are protected to be infringed, what defences there might be, choose a model for protecting them, and then decide whether we're amending the law or designing a new law. And then there's the whole international framework, which is going to be a whole issue in itself. So the life cycle. Each of these points in the life cycle of intellectual property has um, issues that will need to be considered when we're working out if we work out that we do want to um, have laws that offer some protection not necessarily the same as copyright or patent over the outputs of um, intellectual pro uh, of AI generated systems um, generative systems um, each of these, points um, is going to require quite a lot of consideration. Um, so defining the property. We're very used to these concepts, the ones on the left. If you take a registration model like patents or designs, um, the ones on the right, if you have a, a model where you um, look at the subsistence and work out whether something has come into being. Um, you could take bits and pieces from each and put them together to come up with something that might work better in the context of AI. You might find that um, uh, the, the outputs that are produced by, by artificial intelligence systems don't fit so neatly in, as inventions or original authored works. Um, uh, creative works of, that we're familiar with in copyright. And so you might want to come up with something slightly different. Then there's the, the defining the rights. And again, a whole lot to choose from. Um, and then infringement and the different aspects of that. Then you come and you say, well, how are we going to design the law? Are we going to come up with a new law or are we going to amend it? And at each point, you can think about whether registration would be useful. Um, to the extent that we're dealing with something that's outside the international treaty frameworks, it gives a lot of flexibility. But the international legal um, aspect is obviously going to be very complicated. And um, there are a whole, a whole there are an array of issues of private international law, the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments and resolution of disputes. Um, get particularly complicated when different countries have different systems. And then there's the whole issue of how to harmonize, if we want to harmonize, how to avoid the problem of a neo-colonial type 
top-down approach to IP policy making. Um, there is a lot to discuss there. So I'm going to finish off with these two thoughts. First, there are a lot of opportunities here and leadership opportunities for countries who want to lead the way. The UK, for example, moved very fast to consult about reform. It, it held an inquiry, got a lot of um, feedback from its consultation, and then basically adopted a wait and see approach. As you can see from those articles, um, the one on the left you know, summarizes quite succinctly and well um, just what happened there. And uh, even the, the middle point there um, where the UK thought it might change something, it then decided to have a rethink on that. Um, so there are opportunities here for um, countries like Australia if they wanted to take a leadership approach and uh, or a leadership role. And so with that, I just want to finish with this picture of a little frog that I got Dali to draw for me. Mm. Um, and uh, the reason there is a frog in the bottom of the well is because there's a Chinese idiom about a frog that lived in the well all its life. It was born in the well, lived happily in the bottom of the well. It looked up, saw the sky and didn't realize there was anything much outside. And one day a bird comes along and starts telling the frog all about the world outside. And the frog laughs at the bird saying, well, that's, that's preposterous. This is my world. This is the only world I know. And perhaps we don't want to be like the little frog. We want to not be constrained by the existing IP doctrines that have created our established legal frameworks in our minds. Um, there are many options and we should be exploring them and being innovative. And um, if we do decide to go down the sui generis approach, then certainly there's a a possibility that Australia could lead the way um, in thinking about how to, to do that. So I will wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And um, like that, that, was, that was actually spot on, con condensed, obviously, wide ranging and difficult subject matter um, be beautifully into an hour and, and just highlights, I suppose, just how much further work and further discussion that we um, we can and would like to undertake. Um, for my part, I certainly take on on board and and commend to 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 our committee um, the the ethic of thinking about the full range of options uh, when it comes to advising government on these matters, as we'll be doing soon enough, um, and to be thinking outside our our little well. Um, we we are pretty much out of time. I'll just see if I can sneak in a question or, or two. I noticed that um, one of our participants has asked the question, can a generative AI engine be sued for copyright infringement? Um, uh, obviously, that hasn't been done um, in the cases that Mark has identified and wouldn't, wouldn't really be done uh, because, in part, an AI has no money. But, um, <laughs> uh, but, but on that topic of... Who, who is who is the right entity to sue? I did want to raise one thing with um, Mark, noting um, your reference there to Common Crawl being a source of the data used, I think, by GPT three. Who who is it who um, who who is it who provides Common Crawl, and is, is Common Crawl responsible for just scraping all these works that are otherwise protected by copyright? Um, is that the source of, for example, how Getty images might end up in uh, in the hands of GPT? <laughs> so, so you, you can go, you can you can go to Common Crawl. Anybody can access Common Crawl. Um, and Sorry, Mark, could you unmute? I am. I am unmuted. Can you not hear me? Sorry, uh, sorry, that was my bad. Uh, you okay. <laughs> so, so I was just saying. Um, Common Crawl is accessible to everybody. If you've got enough uh, disk space in your own house, you can you can download um, the the entire contents of Common Crawl yourself. Uh, it should not contain material that um, is readily identifiable as as you know not being um, you know, available for scraping. So so it would res it, the organisation behind Common Crawl would respect um, websites that have say paywalls up or um or, or who you know, clearly identify um you know through through technical means or otherwise that that they're 
content um, is is protected by copyright. But of course, everything's protected by copyright. So, so you know, most most of us uh, just accept the fact that when we put stuff out um, on the internet, because we want the public to be able to access it, that there's going to be use made of that that um, you know might not be what we we originally had in mind. Um, you know, I mean, Google crawls our sites so that they become searchable, and we want that to happen. Uh, so the question is, do we want our sites being being um, scraped for the purposes of, of training um, generative AI? Uh, I don't have a, a simple answer to that question because I think when you see how powerful these technologies are, and despite the risks and dangers associated with them, also all the benefits associated with them, I think we probably do want them to exist. Um, appropriately regulated and therefore they need to be trained and they, they need our content to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, thank you again, Mark. Thank you, uh, uh, Alexandra. That was wonderful. I dare say there'll be opportunities where we, um, where we uh, want to speak to you again and maybe there'll be a, a discussion format where we can, we can in interact with you because um, I, for, for my part, would just love to pick your brains um, at nauseam. <laughs> but thank you for today's uh, presentation. That was absolutely um, wonderful. Uh, we're, we're a little over time. So let, let's finish up now. Uh, thank you again, Mark, Alexandra, um, for the members of the committee. See you again next month.